All right, welcome back. We're back. Monitoring and control. Uh, you want to make sure of the sedimentation tank, you're doing visual observation. Uh, we're looking to uh, see again whether or not the clock is settling, water turbulence, channeling, if that's occurring, that's uh, another way of saying short circuiting, clock distribution. Uh, you want to do settling tests, jar testing, and pH, as well as looking at the turbidity. So, what do we do with the sludge that's at the bottom of the tank? You want to make sure, again, that you're disposing of it as needed. Uh, thick sludge blankets cause problems. It's going to create taste and odor, change the characteristics of your plant. Uh, it will also reduce tank capacity. Gas starts to form, causing the solids to float up. And now, again, you have issues with your filters because of all of the different particles going in. Final disposal of the sludge can be in the boom, sewer, um, or it can be dewatered. Now, if you want to dewater, we have sand drying beds, filtration beds, centrifuges, um, different things, belt presses, and final disposal to the sanitary sewer, or it can be hauled to a landfill or a use compost. Lagoon, that's another one. So the final step to make sure that we remove all the pathogenic organisms, especially those that are resistant to chlorine, will be the filtration process. It is the final step for getting rid of these organisms there. Helps to remove suspended solids, pathogens, because sometimes uh, this bacteria or protozoa can kind of hide in the turbidity particles. Um, final step before disinfection, Rapid sand filter is one that is commonly used. With the uh, filters, we're looking at a barrier for removal of Giardia and cryptosporidiosis. We have different types that are out there. We have rapid sand, we have dual media, mixed media, activated carbon pressure filters, as well as membrane filters. With the membrane, remember, that's the micro, the nano, even the reverse osmosis under pressure. We have carbon monoculture, right? Mm -hmm. Anthracite, yeah. Say that at the bottom? Anthracite. Okay. So you all have rapid sand filters? Well, actually, I think they, they're more multimedia filters. Okay. With the anthracite on the top. On the top. Gravel. The white gravel is the first. It's the way it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the design uh, for gravity, we have slow sand, rapid sand, declining rate, dual media, as well as mixed media. Seems like you all said you're dealing with the mixed media. How often do you have to change the media or replace the media? Uh, usually, it's, it, we're, we're in the process of replacing the media in three of our older filters. And uh, it's about 20 years. 20 years, yeah. You don't want to let some of it has a, a, a long lifespan. Right. Yeah. And if you're getting good results, that's right. Well, the same, the new stuff lasts longer, right? Aren't the, the process which they make that the, they refine the stuff or something? Mm -hmm. Remember that that's one salesman? Were you there? I remember it was in your office that salesman was telling us how much longer the new stuff lasts. Oh, that was, that's for South Wellfield, yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Right. We were going to replace, we're going to replace the green sands with fair uh, sands or green sands plus, which is a man-made uh, stuff. Right. Okay. But that's um, that's what that I, I thought I remember was on. With your pressure, we have sand on the diatomaceous earth and membrane again, reverse osmosis. This is just one that is a typical red sand filter here. Um, the various parts, we have the filter walls, the underground system, the media itself, um, inlets and outlets, see that. We have the uh, backwash troughs and piping and uh, valving. All of those are components of the sand filter, uh, along with the instrumentation. The stores are under drained. Again, there are different types that are out there on the market. Uh, perforated pipe, 
stainless, uh, Wagner, Leopold, all of those are out there for the play Willard. Some of the ones that are out there. Looking to. Uh, with your surface agitation, surface uh, wash or air sour, uh, looking at to break up the surface, loosen the cake, solids that are there. Uh, cross connection. Do we have a possibility of cross connection and should we be concerned with cross connection? Remember yesterday we talked about in some of these applications with the membrane, it is possible to have a breakthrough when you're trying to filter out so many different chemical contaminations that are there. So in essence, cross-connection is when, again, we have this water that we filtered and treated to one source, uh, which is potable, and then physically connected to one that's treated to a lesser degree, or one that may contain something harmful. So with water plants, you do have to be concerned about cross connection and eliminating them. Yeah. Um, not far apart the way I was set up. It's not really good. No, but uh, also drinking water. One of the things that we had to do was to put in backflow preventers on all the hoses. Yeah, Remember, I just did it most for, yeah. No, it's not the most ridiculous thing. What's going to get into our hose? That well, the hose is in something. Yeah, and, and there's there's power power but there's 47,000 hose connections in the city that don't have anything on them. What about I mean, in the, in the plant, in the plant. I know, but it, I don't know, it just seems like a, I understand the, the theory behind it, but it just seems like a ridiculous thing that you're just it's wrong. It's a way you. to protect you and the consumer. It's it's a, it happens must to you. To everybody. The same thing could happen in any. Well, that might actually happen. Yeah, it could happen at any host connection and get into the system. So, like, the, you know what I mean? We monitor that stuff. We're a lot more careful than most. Because we're the champion of the environment. We're we the rely champions. on us to get it right yeah. and then to educate others on how to do it. We are, yeah, I understand the theory behind it, but it just seems like that's such a because we put it on our two host tickets of water plant, you know, the other million of them that don't have them on it. Our two are going to save it. You know what I mean? It yeah. just, it seemed like a, like a, like a just a, yeah, you know what I mean? It, it just kind of seemed crazy. All right, so we uh, talked about yesterday backwashing uh, because of that uh, rule there. Again, I think Bill Benjamin, when there's a head loss, six to ten feet, it's time to backwash. Layer flow control is wide open if you have to bid any issues. Or again, based on your manufacturer's recommendation, out 100 hours of operation, it's time to do it just as a preventative uh, situation or part-time operation. And this is the uh, rapid sand filter crossing um, section. All right, so we filtered the water, now we're going to disinfect purpose of disinfection is to ensure healthy people. Healthy people. Okay. That the all those all the right, all of the microbials, pathogenic organisms that are susceptible to chlorine that we are dealing with them. And I keep saying chlorine, but there are a lot of disinfectants that are out there that you can use. Chlorine is just the most common one that we typically use in the US. So, uh, some of the requirements are disinfection is necessary prior to storage. Uh, Pre-treatment storage facilities must have disinfection residual. Your standby disinfection equipment, uh, there is a percentage that you should have on standby at all times. You know what that percentage is? In other words, this is how much chemical that I'm using. How much should I have on standby? What does the rule say? 50% greater than your expectation. Well, for for, for what, 24 hour period? No, then, then your highest amount that you are planning on using. And, and well, how much higher is Well, usually when you're looking at uh, disinfection, 
how um, you should have, what is it, 15 day supply on hand? Before we uh, that's what I'm asking you. What do you mean, 15? 15 days supply, trying to find a good So you said 50% more than you're yeah. using. Well, but then you're using what, in 12 hours or 24 hours or 30 days or? Okay, and the way the way the language is, if you look on page 15 to 14, uh, middle of that page, standby disinfecting equipment and excess capacity 15% greater than the highest expected dosage. And I understand you're saying the highest expected dosage is at a 24-hour time yeah. frame, a month time like we frame. Feed, we feed like 40 pounds a day. Yeah. 40, 50 pounds a day on average, probably. Yeah, like, so, 50% you know, greater than the expected, what's that mean, 100 pounds? I got out of one, you know. Right. They and, don't get a time frame, so we're dosing it seven days a week. You know what I mean? So, like we dose day, it once. even if you're looking at it on an each day basis, okay, this is not working for me um, to have that much on hand is what the rules say. If you're doing 100 pounds, 50% greater, 150 pounds excess. Okay. Are we like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Way more than that. But it just, you know what I mean? How right. It kind of leaves it open and, you know, it's 50% greater than your highest dosage in a, whatever, seven day period or 20 yeah, hour period. Yeah. Because when greater. you start having too much on hand, now we have to start thinking about a um, chemical risk management plan. Right. So. Yeah. Oh, well, you're asking awesome questions. He's thinking. Well, <laughs> oh, well, it just didn't seem like it was a similar thing just stopped and then thought there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, that is a very important thing. We always have. We don't, the last thing we want to do is run out of anything. I mean, there could be a whole zillion of uh, very many reasons for plant failure, you know, power failure, equipment failure. The last thing you want to do is because you run out of Right. We don't have any more chlorine. To have right. at least even if it's for that day, you know, the 50 cent percent greater, you should have ample enough in order to get more in if necessary. But enough to get just started for whatever you're doing. Yeah, I was yeah, I would we never want to go below fifty. Yeah, don't stay on top of it. He goes, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep at night. <laughs> All right. And some of the chemicals that can be used for disinfection, chlorine, chlorine, chlorine dioxide, and ozone. Do you, can you think of any issues with any of these? What about chlorine? Um, issues as far as? As far as the use of chlorine. Very dangerous. Very dangerous. Very good. We have to be careful how we use it. Make sure all the equipment is in good working order. We also have a spill containment. Yeah. Okay. Like that. And that's going to be typical for any chemicals. Very we good. Have, well, we use the uh, I think one plant. The one plant we use chlorine gas, so it doesn't really. We have that automatic shutdown system. Yeah, we have a shutdown system. Do you have one ton cylinders with the yeah, gas? Yeah, two. You have more than you have two, so you have a chemical risk management plan for that yeah. facility. Yeah. Run, wave your hands like that, <laughs> scream, and run. Yeah. That is <laughs> All right. well, we, have, we have an automatic shutdown yeah. system. Yeah. And, uh, Excellent. All the little sniffers and they shut it. What about using too much? Do I have a problem if I use too much chlorine, if I overdose with it? Then, you, then, of course, we, we could violate one of the MCLs, maximum. Okay. Running residual, which is like four. Four, running average, cool. Right. That's very good. So now, again, I could violate that. What else? Um, you know, customer complaints, taste and odor problems. Taste and odor problem. And not only taste and odor problem associated with chlorine, but with all this excess chlorine, I now have also created. There you go, and that's where well. I want to tie it all back in. Right. We want to tie it all back in. Excellent. Which were? Try out methanes is what we end up with when we. Good. Try out methanes. Either we pre-chlorinate or. 
Right, and one of the things that EPA uh, has come out with after all those issues, you know, because a lot of people did use chlorine throughout the whole process, pre as well as post, says use an alternative. If you're using chlorine as the pulse, use a different disinfection as you pre, or vice versa. And so therefore, you're not creating it as much excess amount of chlorine that's there. Matter of fact, the service plans may recommend that you bond the chlorine up by using a different uh, type of chemical, chloramines. In other words, I'm feeding chlorine, and I'm feeding what? Ammonia. Excellent. Chlorine dioxide, who remembers the problems associated with chlorine dioxide? Did they still use that? Chloride. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Chloride chlorates, and again, here I have a maximum residual. I should not uh, go over one milligram per liter, because that's when I start having those formation, which are health issue. 0.8 is the uh, maximum contaminant oh, right. level for that. Ozone also creates issues, um, because again, it's very unstable. It's oxygen, uh, O3, very unstable. Uh, the other drawback, there's no residual. Doesn't last long that in order for us to check the integrity of or the effectiveness of it, although it's probably much more potent than the chlorine. Mm -hmm. It will kill uh, the giardia and cryptosporidium. It so kills everything. Outside. has a very high initial strength, but mm -hmm. no, it doesn't. It's not good for maintaining the system. Yeah, yeah and that's the reason it's very up. difficult to, to do that residual. If you use it for like a pre, right. pre, pre and inspection, then you use better chlorine for the post for the residual. You're but right. it's very expensive too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah and it has to be generated on site. So, yeah, yeah there are issues with that. Right. Now, we, you looked into it at one point, did you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it cost way more. Right. Way. You need electricity. You use a lot of electricity. You have to store oxygen on site mm -hmm. to, to help with the creation of the you can. Yeah, it's, 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 it's involved, you have to have contactors that you call the yeah. ozone through, and you have to have a collection at the top, and it's, it's pretty involved. Yeah. It can be done, and it's yeah, probably going to be done better on a large, for a large scale operation than, than a smaller one. Although I've seen, I don't know, I, but ozone can create taste and odors itself, funny taste and odors. How about ultraviolet? Like nobody's studying UV, anything. absolutely, that's one thing yeah, that can be used that. and is used. Again, I know in Houston, uh, on their newest plant, they actually have the lamps inside the pipe. Right. Uh, but because in Texas, we are required to have a residual disinfection, guess what? They're using the UV plus dosing with chlorine after right. that. Right. It would cut your chlorine dosing way down, though, wouldn't it? Your cost of chlorine, because now you're not using up, you know, three quarters of your dose right. for the initial, the initial disinfection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think the book hasn't said much about it. Yeah, I don't think so it's that is, has it? Uh, I think earlier we talked about it when we were talking about one of the rules that um, it, it vaguely mentioned the, the UV process there as one of your options. It's, it's, it's good. It's good. And UV again will take care of the things such as the GRD and cryptosporidium. Mm -hmm. um, one of the drawbacks, how do we test the integrity of the process? The bulbs have to be changed, you gotta make sure that the, the acid contact is clean so you get good, you know, illumination and all that stuff. Right, because the uh, again, the intensity of the light that goes through there will affect the effectiveness of the process. So how do we test for the effectiveness? We have to run a back T. When we run a back T, how long does that take? Hours. Yeah, 18 to 24 hours. What has happened to that water? A lot of water gone by. It's gone by. Now, when you look at chemicals, it's a way with some of the chemicals to get in there and test the effectiveness immediately, such as with the If the residual is there, I know the demand has been met. And I'm good to go as long as I'm at the level, minimum level that they say I should be. At which is a 0.2 or 0.5 combined. Now, I'm not trying to drag this out, I'm just curious. With the ultraviolet, 
bacteria itself that's very effective. Mm -hmm. Does it cause any growth or any issues with growing like organic algae? Absolutely, because what it's what it's doing is disrupting the DNA process itself, affecting that. So anything in that water that passes through those lamps can be affected. And would it help? To, would it grow? Oh, you're asking will it would it grow? Would it grow? Because ultraviolet light, like that's what. No, well, well actually, you know, think of it, these fish ponds people have. One of the ways you use to control algae is, is to use it's UV. UV. That controls it instead of. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things they thought of the, the reservoir before it was built, remember they put that wet one thing yeah. in, and I said, well, this sounds good, but what I would recommend, and I tried to get them to do this, was the one, you know, each of the outlets is to, to put, you know, uh, uh, an ultraviolet uh, bulb, you know, or mm -hmm. the process so that we can zap that, that water that went by there. And uh, so our reservoir is turning into an algae pond. Well, it, mm -hmm. it's. Well, we can well, in the so summer. Maybe months. they revisit that now. I mean, we use Especially the if they can cottage the keys of all of your pipes yeah. and transfer pipes. The, the cost of the ultraviolet compared to the cost of replacing all these all the pipes. I don't know, know. You may come out better with replacing yeah. because I mean, initially the the system probably is, is quite expensive. Yeah. Maintenance. Well, that was yeah. It's another Here's thing. Really you can't just put it in, especially if you have your returned water, put it in, let it go. No, there's maintenance involved with yeah. these systems. All right, and then clear well storage at the plant. Your storage is considered clear well. It provides detention time for disinfection. In other words, that contact time that's necessary for chlorine in order to uh, do its thing. Yeah, and our, our, our clear well has got valves in it so that it, yeah. Yeah, I've been in there. Yeah. Okay, so you have a boat. You've right. been in there with a boat? Yeah, a little inflatable boat. We put that in there. Yeah, I forget what the heck we're doing there looking for. I think it was when we were messing with the, uh, the outlet, the pipe, the outlet pipe out of the filters. Right. We were changing it all yeah. So what did you do after you got out of the clear well with the boat? We coordinated. <laughs> uh, 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 I thought you were thinking to me. I'm like, Hopefully you disinfected uh, yourself before going in and disinfected the boat. Well, that's the dive. Yeah, we had three divers going there, too. I don't even remember that. Yeah. Well, they, so they had, it wasn't in use at that time. We isolated it, shut it off. And then we had a nice spray that we got. Well, sure we got all of that. Yeah, oh, yeah, we, that it, it was a lot. Yeah. We weren't doing maintenance while it was in use. So the divers down in there while we were pumping water out. Yeah. All right. They revisit the surface water treatment rules uh, as far as humidity limits. Again, you probably, you're seeing this now every time you close your eyes because we've talked about must be um, equal to or less than 0.3 and 95% of the monthly samples. No samples shall exceed one NTU. And again, the frequency, if you have less than 500 people, can be reduced to one per day with uh, con consensual agreement from your agency. Disinfection requirements under the surface water treatment rule 99.9% in activation of Giardia lamblia. It's at um, 99, 3 log, and a 4 log, 99.99%. That's the 4 log uh, in activation of viruses. Report inadequate disinfection to the state by the next business day, and not more than 5% of the distribution sample uh, can have inadequate residual for two consecutive months. We're going to monitor the chlorine um, based on the size of the population. Again, less than 500. We're looking at one residual a day. 501 to 1,000, two a day. Um, 1,001 to uh, 2,500, three a day. And up to 3,300, we're looking at four a day. You may have to set up tracer studies to assess, assess the adequacy of your disinfection contact time, and you want to make sure that you studies like that, you submit that information to the state. Uh, if your surface water is influencing your groundwater or well water, 
again, you want to evaluate your surface organism, and if present, then you have to step it up a notch and start the treatment that are required for surface water. The last component of this particular module deals with fluoride again. Fluoride is almost where we started initially uh, yesterday with the inorganics. Um, remember what they said that improper amounts, fluoride is a good thing because it does what? Promote good, yeah, prevent cavities, promote good dental health. Uh, so beneficial, low concentration, 0.71 milligrams per uh, liter. But when it starts to get above two, that's when we start seeing the modeling for the brown staining of the tooth enamel. And if it gets up above that, that four, now that brown stain becomes a pit. Primary regulation or primary standards, four milligrams per liter. The secondary, the aesthetic, two milligrams per liter. You don't even want this to start at this point. Because if it gets much higher than that, then the job can lose it too. If um, there are some systems that are traditionally low in fluoride and because they know that it can be a good thing for um, tooth decay, they may add fluoride to their systems. So some of the systems will add it in the form of sodium fluoride, sodium basilical fluoride, fluorocytic acids are some of the ones that are added via pump. We add fluoride. We add fluoride? Yeah. Okay. Hydro uh, fluorocytic acid is another one that can be used. Okay. Uh, if you have too high of fluoride, and in some areas it's just naturally occurring, uh, you can use activated aluminum beds, and we talked about those yesterday for removal, uh, reverse osmosis, mineralizers, all those are things that can take the excess fluoride out. Are there any questions? Comments, concerns, or issues. Well, just, just real quick. Um, mm -hmm. The where I used to work, we uh, we used to use aluminum sulfate. It was more of a an older conventional plant. With uh, you know, we had a big, we had a, a mix, big mixing chamber, and then it went into a sanitation mm -hmm. um, area, and. Uh, we used aluminum sulfate there. That's what was used there for years. And uh, we would, every winter, especially if we had very cold weather, we used to have some issues, treatment issues because of the temperature. Um, so we ended up, to make a long story short, we ended up switching to something called ferric chloride, which is a okay. byproduct right. of a pigment process around here. And that stuff, as you as you showed, it, it works in a real wide pH range. It, it worked beautifully, and uh, we we made the transition nicely there. And when I came here, you know, I thought of it at first. Uh, uh, you know, oh, is there anything we use? Because they use we use aluminum sulfate here, but the treatment process is not conducive to ferric chloride. Ferric chloride, you got to be careful. If you overdose it. Now you've got, you know, red, you know, you've got a, you've got excess iron in the water, which is, right. and you see it. So um, it's just not a, for our particular processes, and we have a fairly quick flow through time. You know, we have, uh, you know, we have flocculation and sedimentation all in, in a very small area. So it, it, the, the aluminum sulfate works works fine in this application. Okay, and that's what you have to do. Right. is to look at your options and, and see what works well given what you have. Right. I mean, you can always, I mean, you know, and there's, you can do pilot studies yeah. if you want to. Excellent. You should do all that. I'm sure that's yeah, what that you all be. would recommend because before you just go and do something, you need to be reasonably assured it's going to work. And not only am I doing the pilot studies, but what else am I doing? Because if I change chemicals like that, Oh, you got to notify the state. Yeah, notify make make the sure state. they're aware of what you're doing. Absolutely. Pilot studies are excellent. Um, and in some cases, you can look at the various chemicals as it relates back to cost, because cost is something that a lot of people are concerned with now. Now, with using the ferric glaze more or less, okay, based on the alkalinity of my water, because 
Remember the different chemicals work well with different waters as far as alkalinity. So that's another thing to take into consideration, which is that buffering capacity. They are water. We're really close to neutral at those plants. Ground and surface water are weak. And without even any uh, pH treatment, we stay real close to new six, 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 seven. Just when we're okay. raw water coming in, which isn't it's not too far off either, you know. The natural alkalinity is, is sufficient. Yeah. Right. We're just kind of be lucky that way. Yeah. And a little bit of lime. 